Today's video is sponsored by Call of War. Do you ever wonder, what kind of leader would I be if I was in charge of a whole country? Well, wonder no more, because with the free online PvP strategy game, Call of War, you get to choose a real country to lead during World War II. It requires you to use a variety of different units, such as tanks and planes, as well as other secret weapons, in order to build your army. You can play with the same account on both PC and mobile. It's such great fun, and the thing I love most about the game is the long-term strategy element. I'm giving my viewers a special gift. If you click on the link below, you'll get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. And you can even join my custom game by entering my custom game ID and password after you sign up using my special link in the description. I'll reveal my custom game details at the end of the video, so be sure to stick around. Hey, 42 here. On the 17th of August, 1987, a frail 93-year-old man unplugged a lamp from the table in his summer house, then lifted the extension cord with his trembling, arthritic fingers, and began patiently winding it around the latch of a nearby window. When he was satisfied the cord was secure, he made a loop at the other end, placed that loop around his neck, and allowed himself to slide slowly to the floor. Pulling the makeshift noose tight around his neck and cutting off the air supply to his lungs. Within minutes, he was dead. If you're wondering why this ancient man had decided to take such drastic action, I can confirm it wasn't an act of erotic asphyxiation gone wrong, and neither was it an accident, although some people believe it may have been a murder made to look like a suicide. But before we get into all of that, perhaps it would be helpful if I told you exactly who this particular OAP was. Because what I've just described were the final earthly actions of a man named Rudolf Hess. Husband, father, keen gardener, avid hiker. Oh, and one time second in command to a guy called Adolf Hitler. Hess was so notorious that at the time of his suicide, he was the sole inmate in a 600-cell fortress prison presided over by a cadre of guards from the UK, France, the United States, and the Soviet Union. Representatives from these countries would take it in turn to guard Hess, rotating personnel from one month to the next. For an idea of how much effort and expense went into guarding this one man, just picture the prison that houses Tai Lung in the first Kung Fu Panda film, and you're pretty much there. Almost as soon as Hess was found dead, the entire prison that held him was razed to the ground so as not to become a shrine to neo-Nazis. But before it was unceremoniously demolished, the prison was known as Spandau, and it was located in Western Berlin. At the end of World War II, a series of court proceedings known as the Nuremberg Trials took place to determine the fate of high-ranking Nazis. Many were sentenced to death by hanging, a handful were acquitted, but seven of them, including Rudolf Hess, ended up serving prison sentences of varying lengths in Spandau. By the way, if the name Spandau is ringing a bell, you might be thinking of the British new wave pop group Spandau Ballet. And oddly enough, the band did indeed get its name from the prison that housed Rudolf Hess and other prominent Nazis. Specifically, the name refers to the involuntary jig danced by Spandau inmates in their death throes during execution by hanging. Lovely name for a band, that! Anyway, whilst Hess was the last of the Spandau Seven to leave the prison, and the only one that did so in a body bag, he was also the first of them to be captured. You see, unlike his fellow inmates who were rounded up at the end of the war, Hess had already been in prison in Britain for some four years at that point, and the story of how he ended up there is quite possibly the strangest ever to come out of the Second World War. It starts with a friendship bordering on obsession with one of the most evil men in history. 
includes a secret solo flight to Scotland across war-torn Europe, and ends in one of the longest prison sentences ever served by a human being. Allow me to explain. Despite being a fierce patriot and nationalist, Rudolf Hess was actually born in Egypt, and wouldn't make Germany his permanent home until the age of 14, when he went to boarding school there. He was 20 by the time the First World War broke out, and having signed up pretty much straight away, he served Germany with distinction, fighting in the First Battle of Ypres and the Battle of Verdun during which time he earned both a bullet through his lung and an iron cross second class. The war ended when Hess was 24, and much like every other soldier, he went home and tried to build a life for himself. But one evening in July of 1920, this unfamiliar new existence took a decisive turn, because that night, Rudolf Hess heard Adolf Hitler speak in front of a crowd for the very first time. Hess had harboured racist views his entire life. Whilst growing up in Egypt, he'd shown contempt for everyone who wasn't white, and he believed Germany had lost the First World War thanks to a widespread conspiracy of Jews and Bolsheviks. So it was no surprise that he was drawn to Hitler like a big racist moth to a bright, bigoted flame. Hess signed up to the Nazi party that very same night. From that point on, he was rarely found far from the future Führer's side. He acted as Hitler's muscle at rallies, where clashes of ideology frequently escalated into exchanges of punches, and helped out with fundraising for the party, along with pretty much anything else that needed doing. When Hitler attempted to seize control, first of Munich and then the German national government, during what is now known as the Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, Hess was once again by his side. The coup failed, and both Hitler and Hess were sent to prison for five years. But even behind bars, Hess managed to keep himself useful to the man he saw as the future of his nation, scribing and editing for Hitler as he dictated what would become the foundation of the Nazi Party manifesto, Mein Kampf. To say Hess was at the centre of the Nazi Party during these formative years would be akin to claiming heroin is a tad Moorish. It's true, it's just one hell of an understatement. Hess was a fanatical follower of Hitler's ideology, and unlike plenty of other Nazis, he wasn't in it for the glory or the power, but just because he believed. And through his belief and his devotion to Hitler, he became one of the most important figures in the Führer's rise. The silent Bob to Hitler's J. The Bert to his Ernie. The... Wait, is it just me? Or is Rudolf Hess actually the spitting image of Bert? Well, that's something I'm never going to be able to unsee. Anyway, despite literally trying to overthrow the government of their own country, Hitler and Hess were released from prison after serving less than a year behind bars. And around 10 years after that, Hitler achieved his ultimate goal of becoming the leader of the German Reich this time through the slightly more mainstream method of actually getting people to vote for him. Within the year, his power in Germany was absolute. But despite having hit the big time, Hitler remembered his old friend Hess, repaying his enduring loyalty by honouring him with the title of Deputy Führer, and eventually going as far as to make Hess second in line to the leadership of the entire Nazi party behind Hermann Göring, the supreme commander of the Luftwaffe. As for Hess, he couldn't have been happier. The man he viewed as something close to Germany's messiah was in power. The country he loved was back on the road to greatness after the shame of its defeat in the Great War. And Hess himself was right in the thick of it, as one of Hitler's most trusted confidants. But as war descended across Europe in 1939, things began to change. Despite his military record, Hess's main duties weren't directly related to the war effort. 
And as Hitler became more and more distracted with blitzkrieg tactics and complex foreign policy, for the first time since 1920, Hess found himself on the outside of Hitler's inner circle, looking in. As the war progressed, he began to grow more and more worried. It wasn't so much that things were going badly, quite the opposite in fact. By the middle of 1940, Germany controlled much of Europe. Poland, Norway, Denmark, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, half of France. But these early successes had gone to Hitler's head. The Germans and their allies were starting to get cocky. This growing sense of invincibility in the Nazi camp was one of the driving forces behind Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's plan to invade the Soviet Union. But Hess was concerned that taking on both the Allies and the Soviet Union, who up until now had largely stayed out of things, and in some cases actively worked with the Germans, was just asking for trouble. Hess felt that trying to fight against the British and the Soviets simultaneously would stretch German resources too thin. And so, whilst Hitler and his cronies were putting the finishing touches to their plans for Operation Barbarossa, Hess was finalising a plan all of his own. One that no one, not even the Führer, ever saw coming. Hess's scheme was simple. He reasoned that if fighting on two fronts had the potential to be a military disaster, all he had to do was remove one of Germany's enemies from the equation. And so, Rudolf Hess was going to take the British out of World War II. On his own. But if you're picturing Bert from Sesame Street dressed in full Rambo regalia, storming the Houses of Parliament in search of Winston Churchill, you're a little wide of the mark. Hess didn't plan to defeat the British in battle, he was going to neutralise them at the negotiating table by suing for peace. And how exactly he attempted to do that is without a doubt one of the single weirdest things to have happened in the whole of the Second World War. Hess, an accomplished pilot, secretly had a Messerschmitt modified with long-range fuel tanks and several other updates to equip it for long-distance flying. He trained tirelessly in the aircraft for many months, focusing on his navigation skills and efficient flying techniques. And then, one night in the spring of 1941, as war raged across Europe and the German Luftwaffe prepared for a huge bombing raid on London, the Deputy Führer, second in line to the command of the entire Nazi party, took off from an airfield in the south of Germany all on his own, and set a course for Scotland. Now then, this is probably the part of the story where I should point out that Hess may have been a little bit mad. Rumour has it this whole wild scheme came to him in a dream, and he chose the date of his departure based on the advice of his astrologer who had a good feeling about the alignment of a couple of planets and stuff. Apparently feeling he no longer had the Führer's trust, Hess planned this crazed mission entirely alone and without informing Nazi leadership, hoping to hand Hitler the keys to peace with Britain before anyone even realised he was missing. Still, mad or otherwise, Hess knew how to handle an aeroplane. He flew solo over largely unfamiliar terrain in foggy weather, and with only charts and maps for guidance, all whilst avoiding British air defences and more than one RAF squadron sent to intercept him. He flew much of the latter part of the journey at an altitude of just 15 metres in order to better avoid British fighter pilots. Hess's destination was Dungavel House, home of the Duke of Hamilton, whom Hess understood was keen on peace with Germany and had the power to help broker it. Hess never quite made it though. His masterclass in navigation and evasive flying didn't quite get him to his destination because he ran out of fuel just 12 miles away. 
forcing him to bail out of his Messerschmitt and parachute to safety. A local man found him not too long after, still struggling to extricate himself from his chute in a field just outside the village of Waterfoot, south of Glasgow. Hess, assuming the false name Alfred Horn, asked to be taken straight to see the Duke of Hamilton. But this was Britain, so instead of doing as Hess asked, instinct kicked in and the man who'd found him followed the single most important rule in the Great British Manual of Etiquette. He took Hess home to his cottage and made him a nice cup of tea. Hess was eventually allowed to meet with Hamilton, but after revealing his true identity and explaining his mission, he soon encountered a problem common to many foreigners visiting Scotland. Hess spoke fluent English and had no difficulty getting his point across. The only trouble was he couldn't understand a damn thing Hamilton was saying in response. A translator was sent for to turn Hamilton's English into more English, uh, but it soon became clear Hess's problems didn't end with Hamilton's incomprehensible Scottish accent. The Duke had neither the power nor the inclination to make peace with Germany. So, less than 24 hours in, Hess's grand mission was a failure. Even worse, because he'd made it clear he wasn't acting under the orders of Hitler and was therefore not in Scotland as part of an official envoy, instead of being sent back to Germany as a diplomat, Hess was thrown in jail. Not that anyone really knew what to do with him once they put him there. Hamilton himself rang Winston Churchill to explain this strange turn of events, but the Prime Minister found the idea of Hitler's right-hand man parachuting into a small village in Scotland, all on his lonesome, to negotiate peace so ridiculous he assumed Hamilton was playing an ill-conceived joke on him and hung up. Back in Germany, Hitler wasn't finding the situation particularly funny either. When word got back to him about his deputy's impromptu Highland holiday, Hitler is said to have let out an animalistic roar that shook the walls of his mountain home before decreeing that if Hess ever returned to Germany, he would be shot on sight. Not that Hess needed to worry about that. He would never be allowed to return home, at least not as a free man. After his capture in 1941, he would spend the rest of his long life as a prisoner. During the war, he was held in various different facilities across the UK, including a brief spell in the Tower of London, becoming the last state prisoner ever to be held there. And the last prisoner full stop, aside from notorious London gangsters, the Cray Twins, who spent a few days there in 1952. Hess's 46 years as a prisoner represents one of the longest sentences ever served in history. The 32nd longest outside of the US, according to Wikipedia, and the last 20 years of his term were spent in complete solitary confinement. Not as a punishment for bad behavior, but because, as I've already mentioned, he was the only inmate left in the entire prison at the time. From almost a moment he was captured, Hess showed signs of the extreme paranoia and superstition that have led many people over the years to question his sanity. He was obsessed with the idea his captors were trying to poison him, often refusing meals or insisting on swapping plates with his guards before eating. He also believed in all sorts of extreme conspiracy theories, including that both Churchill and Hitler were under the control of psychic Jews. In just a couple of weeks, on the 10th of May, it will be 80 years to the day since Rudolf Hess's flight. Yet, still today, this strange story of one man's attempt to alter the course of the war remains so bizarre, many people believe there must be more to it than meets the eye. One popular theory suggests Hitler knew all about the apparently solo mission, but that it was agreed up front if Hess was ever captured, he would be disavowed and branded a madman so as not to damage morale back in Germany. 
In 2011, German newspaper Der Spiegel reported on the recovery of a statement written in a Soviet concentration camp by Hess's personal aide, which did appear to suggest the Führer had been fully aware of Hess's mission. Though there's no guarantee the report wasn't coerced, especially considering where it was written. Another theory suggests Hess was actively lured into making the trip by the British Secret Service, who posed as the Duke of Hamilton in a series of letters in an attempt to trick Hess into coming to Britain. Again, shreds of evidence seem to back this story up, but none are in any way conclusive. For a long time, one of the more persistent conspiracies surrounding the case was that Hess never actually made the journey at all, and that an imposter had flown in his place. This theory was put forward by British Army Surgeon Hugh Thomas, who, on giving Hess a medical exam, found no trace of the bullet wound Hess had suffered in World War I. According to Thomas, the single inmate serving out his years in Spandau Prison was not, and never had been, Rudolf Hess. This story persisted all the way up until 2019, when DNA testing of an old sample of Hess's blood was shown to have a 99.99% .99 match in Y-chromosomal DNA with one of Hess's living relatives. Most of the conspiracy theories surrounding Hess are speculative at best, but there is still something of an air of mystery to the whole story. And whilst the majority of classified documents from the Second World War have long since been released into the public domain, one small cache has been held back far longer than most, and, believe it or not, it's reported to contain correspondence between Hess and none other than King George VI himself. Conspiracy theorists believe these files may uncover a plot within the British monarchy to ditch Winston Churchill and make peace with Germany, back when things weren't looking so good for Europe at the start of the war. The files are due to be released 20 years from now, by the way, on the 100th anniversary of the flight, which is probably for the best. The royal family could do with a few quiet years. As for Hesse's ultimate demise at the age of 93, even that has attracted some whispers. Is it really possible that a very old, very frail man could have hanged himself? And why would he have even wanted to after so long behind bars? It's true that he tried, and failed, to take his own life many times over the years, but some people still believe he was eventually bumped off by the British, who were worried about what secrets he might spill if released. It's a big claim but there were a few odd inconsistencies relating to his death. Most notably the fact the apparent suicide note found beside the body had actually been written after Hess feared dying when admitted to hospital with a perforated ulcer in 1969. Still, that certainly isn't proof, and if it really was a Secret Service hit, it seems mighty incompetent of them to have attempted to pass off a 20-year-old letter as a suicide note. As for what really compelled Rudolf Hess to risk the dangerous and undeniably daring flight from Germany to Scotland in the middle of the Second World War, that's open for debate. Was he simply someone standing on the very edge of sanity, making a wild play to regain the favour of the man he worshipped? Or was he on a secret mission from the Fuhrer himself to broker peace with the British in a move that, if successful, could have changed the entire course of the war, and therefore the history of mankind? Maybe. Or perhaps it had just been far, far too long since he'd had a good haggis. Thanks for watching. Thanks again to Call of War for sponsoring this video. And remember, you can claim your exclusive gift by clicking the link in the description. This offer is only available for 30 days, so choose your country and fight your way to victory.